Well, a few months ago, my wife, Lorene, and I were home uh, on a typical weekday evening. Our son, Jesse, was home as well. He's the one that lives with us now. And Jess and I were sitting on the family room couch watching, kind of halfway watching the game or something on TV, and I had my laptop open, sort of halfway working on something. And it's important that you hear those two little details for what happens next, because I was already kind of paying attention to TV and my computer, because my wife walked in this other side of the room, and uh, out of that part of my consciousness still available, I became aware she was saying something. <laughs> and, what, and what she said, I thought, was, this is our first week missing Canaan. And that made sense to me because uh, Canaan's our youngest son. He'd just gone back to college a few days earlier. And so without taking my eyes from the TV, I said, yeah, I miss Canaan too. <laughs> and then there was this awkward pause and then she said, what did you think I just said? <laughs> and I became aware that, that maybe there was a problem, so I turned my head from the TV and I said to her, uh, you said this is our first week missing Canaan. And she immediately burst into laughter. Jesse just shook his head sadly. <laughs> and she said, what I said was, this is our first week missing our cleaning ladies. She said. <laughs> I tell that story because it illustrates a couple of important truths. Not that I don't listen to my wife. It's that my, my focus is so intense. I can only aim it at one or two things at the same time. Right, guys? That's the, that's the, that's the problem. Actually, here's the point. There's a big difference between hearing and listening. A big difference between hearing and listening. And we're in a summer-long series called The Disciplines of Grace. And week by week, we've been talking about uh, building these spiritual habits into our lives. Uh, habits like gratitude, like generosity, serving, confession. And today we're going to talk about the discipline of listening. And we're going to look at a, a story Jesus told or an illustration Jesus gave in the Gospel of John uh, that teaches us not just to hear but to listen. It comes to us in John chapter 10. I'm going to read the first 10 verses, and then we'll go back and kind of look at it piece by piece. This is, this is the voice of Jesus speaking. He says, Very truly I tell you Pharisees. Now, remember, the Pharisees were the most religious people of the day, uh, uh, but they did not believe Jesus was the Messiah of God. Very truly I tell you Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. Now notice he's using a, a picture that people in that culture and time would immediately recognize. They had all seen sheep. They all knew what shepherds did. If Jesus were here today in suburban North America, I sense he might, I suspect he might talk about our pet Labrador retrievers or, or something we would understand. Verse 2, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of a speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved, and they will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is that when Jesus uses this image of sheep to talk about our relationship with him, it's not, it's not particularly a flattering analogy for us. Um, now, I'm not a shepherd. Uh, but maybe some of you grew up on a farm and, 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 have, and know how sheep are. And if so, maybe you can, you can help me with this understanding. But sheep are, are cute and cuddly from a distance. But up close, not so much. Uh, sheep are actually up close, rather filthy animals. Their wool includes a substance called lanolin. It makes stuff stick to it. Dirt and mud and sticks and even their own waste sticks to the wool. And sheep don't have the ability to clean themselves, so they have to wait for the shepherd to take care of them and even to clean them up a bit. Sheep are also fairly helpless creatures. They are timid and easily frightened. Where goats can kind of fend for themselves, sheep aren't like that. They need care. They need a shepherd to feed them and guide them. Sheep need a shepherd. And Jesus is saying there are two kinds of shepherds. First, he says, there is the false shepherd. 
and he teaches about the false shepherd. Way back when I was in, uh, just out of college, um, I lived with my parents for a summer, and one night that summer I, I stayed out very late with some friends. You know, kind of a, an old college habit, and so those of you who are still college students, you know, kind of know what I'm talking about. Nothing starts happening in college after midnight, so it was well after midnight when I got home, and I got home to find out that the door's locked to our house. My dad had locked the door, either out of habit or intentionally, but he locked the door, uh, and so I, I didn't want to ring the doorbell and wake everybody up because of how, how late or early it was, this case may be. Uh, so I decided to get in another way. And so I walked around to the side of the garage, looked, checked the garage door, it was locked. Then I walked around to the back, our screened in porch, that screen door was open, but the sliding glass door leading into our house was locked. What are we gonna do? Oh, one more window. There's a window over our, the kitchen sink, kind of up like that small window. I pulled on it and it slid open. So I, I took off my shoes, threw them in the house, and I climbed headfirst into the house through the kitchen window, fell into the sink, tumbled into the kitchen, and managed to do so without waking anybody up. Now, why did I do that? I had to go in another way because I, I didn't have a key. In that sense, the house didn't belong to me. That's what Jesus says here. He says, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. He uses two words here. Thief and robber, they come from Greek words. One is kleptes, from which we get our word kleptomania, and that's one who steals by stealth, sort of sneaks in and takes something. The other word, translated robber, is one who plunders with violence, a different kind of word. So a thief might sneak into my house and steal my TV, and I don't even know it until the next day. A robber breaks in, assaults me, assaults my family, then takes my TV. Jesus says that's what the false shepherd does. In fact, in verse 10, he says, the thief comes only to steal kill, and destroy. Question, who is he talking about? Now here he's actually talking about the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees were the most religious of the day, but they taught a kind of legalistic righteousness. They were those who took great pride in their strict adherence to religious law, but whose hearts were actually far from God. Jesus is saying they're like false shepherds because they are teaching religion without a genuine relationship with God. So, next question, who or what are the false shepherds in our day, in our time, in our culture? Who are the thieves and robbers that steal, kill, and destroy? Now, we might think of those things that destroy life, like disease, things like depression, addictions, alcoholism. But the Bible says behind all of those is our ultimate enemy and the enemy of God. The Bible calls Satan the liar, the deceiver, the destroyer. We see him as early as, as the very first, second chapters of Genesis when the serpent comes into the scene as the one who questions the very goodness of God, the one who lies to Adam and Eve, the one who tempts, the one who makes bad things look good, who promises that we can be like God. You don't need God's limits for your life. You can be like God. You can make the rules. He promises to make us happy, but he destroys. That's why in 1 Peter we read, be alert and of sober mind. Because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Some of you know I just returned Thursday night from a 17-day trip to Turkey and Africa to visit a number of our Serve the World partners that we are involved with as a church. Wonderful experience. Um, places like Tanzania, Zanzibar, Rwanda, Uganda, Istanbul. Uh, and in those parts of the world, uh, the enemy, our adversary, attacks in in some very obvious ways, through devastating poverty. In Africa, everywhere you look, just overwhelming physical needs, devastating poverty, through the oppressive power of Islam. And in many places in Africa, superstitions that are rooted in centuries-old practices of curses and witch doctors that leave people in fear and bondage. It's obvious, you can see it. But here, in our culture, I think the enemy is much more subtle. His lies are the same lies back in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden, but much harder for us to recognize. For example, the promise that more wealth will make us happier. It's a lie. For example, the promise that more education or more politics or more science will eventually solve all human problems. Or more than any of those, what I call our cultural gospel today. Do you know what the cultural gospel is today in our culture? We hear it all the time. It's that you are your own truth. 
Speak your truth. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Say that on a talk show, everybody claps. It's the, culture, it's the gospel of our day. We don't need God to give us some sort of eternal truth. We are truth ourselves. You don't need to be told. You can determine what's right and what's wrong for yourself. Jesus says those are, those are lies. Those are the false shepherd. They don't come to bring life. They come to steal, kill, and destroy. Do not listen to that voice, he says. But how do we discern the difference? How do we know the true shepherd's voice from the false shepherd? We have to understand and know the true shepherd. And that's the second point today, the true shepherd. Now, when I was growing up as a boy, um, six, eight, ten years old, like some of you here today, uh, one of the constants in my early life was my father's ability to whistle. Uh, he, somewhere in his life, he learned this unique talent. It's really a gift, kind of. He didn't use his fingers at all. He just would purse his lips, and he could utter a shrill, high-pitched, loud whistle with a, with a really recognizable kind of tune to it. And my brother and I learned to recognize that whistle because when it was supper time, that's what he would do. He would step out in the front porch or the back porch and he would whistle. And we'd be out playing in the neighborhood, you know, a couple blocks away, I don't know, a quarter mile, half mile away, so playing touch football, whatever. And we would hear this whistle wafting through the neighborhood. And one or the other of us would say, wait, stop, 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 stop. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? And we would just drop everything and run home. Because that whistle meant supper time. And we'd run home. We'd run home because we recognized that was our dad's whistle. And we knew our father loved us. We knew we had a home to go to where we had a mom and we had food on the table, a place where we were loved, a place where we belonged. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He says, the, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought them out, uh, when he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. So Jesus is saying the true shepherd enters by the gate. And a few verses later, verse 7, he says he is the gate for the sheep. He says, I am the gate. He's using an analogy here from the ancient world where shepherds would build a small enclosure in the field of rocks or, or sticks or brush, and it would have an opening in it. And the sheep would go in at night, and the shepherd would lay across the doorway himself, protecting the sheep with his own body from predators and keeping them safe. And he, Jesus is saying he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And then he says, the sheep listen to the true shepherd because the shepherd knows them by name. Now, it's interesting. Even though sheep are not the most intelligent of barnyard creatures, uh, they, we do now know that they can recognize human faces. Sheep can recognize up to 50 human faces and remember them. They also recognize voices, particularly their shepherd's voice. They learn to recognize it. So here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, he knows you. He's saying he knows your name. Now, I want to let that sink in just a bit. He knows your name. Has that ever dawned on you? The Bible says that he knew you before you were born. Wrap your head around that one. And then every day of your life, from the first day to this day, where you are right now, he's known you. Your best days and your worst days. Your joys and your sorrows. No matter how far away from him you've been, no matter how fast you've been running the other direction, no matter how deep the shame and failure you may have experienced, he's known you, and he's loved you, and he calls you to trust him and to follow his voice. Jesus says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And when the shepherd led the sheep out, he was leading them out to pasture, to feed, to water. He was giving them life. And it leads to the third point today, the promise of true life. Now, one of the great uh, blessings of traveling uh, the world and being in different parts of the world is to meet uh, just extraordinary people, extraordinary, ordinary people around the world who are just doing amazing things. People like Pastor Fred Wangwa. I spent two days with Fred in Uganda, and one day as we were driving somewhere, I just asked him to tell me a story. And in Uganda, uh, English is 
is a very close second language to the, to the language they speak. Uh, and he told me a story. I'll put it in a nutshell. He grew up as one of 12 children born to a mother and an alcoholic father. His early life was so impoverished that he would often go days without having any food. In fact, one of his younger brothers died of starvation with him looking on. Never went to school. His father wouldn't take him to school. Uh, and by age six, he was working in local fields just to be able to get a little bit of money to buy food at age six. At age seven, he realized that if he didn't find another way to live, he was going to die. And so he found his way to this tiny little village church near where he lived and heard the gospel of Jesus for the first time, that there was a shepherd who knew him and loved him. And he said he went back every day to that church at age seven, eight, nine, because people cared for him and loved him, and he learned and learned and learned. And then eventually, as a teenager, late teenager, he went, had a chance to go to a Bible, little by tiny Bible college in Uganda. And they discovered he was so bright that they scholarshiped him all the way through. He had never been to school. He was preliterate. But he went through Bible college, and fast forward, at age 23, he was asked to become the pastor of that same church. And then in the 11 years since, he took over as pastor of that church. He's led the construction of a new church building, where I had a chance to preach last Sunday morning. Uh, he developed a preschool. He has plans for an elementary school. He found a way to plant 10 new churches in the mountains up uh, behind the city and train the 10 pastors who now lead those 10 churches. And on top of all that, he serves as the spiritual director of the Cure Hospital of Uganda, one of the top neurological surgery centers in all of East Africa. And he was the one who invited me to preach in his church. I should be inviting him to preach to my church. And then that afternoon, Without any warning, he invited me to participate in a baptism in a muddy river in a cornfield. We baptized 12 people, one of whom, the last guy, this guy here, became a, a believer in Christ just that day out of a Muslim background. Now, here's why I tell Fred's story. Pastor Fred is not famous. I'd never heard of him before, and you never heard of him either. He doesn't have a blog, doesn't have a website. He's never going to be able to publish a book. He's poor by our standards. But at age 34... Pastor Fred has already lived a life of extraordinary greatness. I think he's a living example of the fullness of life Jesus is talking about. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. Now, something interesting here, the word life, uh, the word used for life here is not the word you would expect. It's not the word for biological life. That's the word bios in Greek, from which we get biological. He uses the word zoe here. Like the, like the name Zoe. And Zoe means a different kind of life, a different quality of life. It means spiritual life. It means eternal life. It means fullness of life. Now, what kind of life does Jesus promise? I think Jesus promises new life in at least four ways, and you may have heard me talk about this before. First, he promises a new heart. A new heart. When I got home from my trip Thursday night, I had a uh, a bag that weighed probably 45 pounds, and every piece of clothing in my, in my luggage was dirty from that trip because I couldn't do laundry as I traveled. Every piece, sweat, dirt from the road, dust, mud, all that stuff. And opening up that bag after 25 hours of travel was kind of a traumatic experience because all that, <laughs> that, my clothes needed to, be, needed to be washed. And the same is true for our hearts. Our hearts are dragged through this world, stained by sin and stained by pain, now, our culture doesn't use the word sin anymore. We just don't in public discourse. But everybody knows what it is. We all know what it is. Guilt and regret and pain. Every person you've ever known in your life, from your family to your coworkers to your neighbors, everybody you know today, everyone else in this room today is trying to deal with a heart question in some way, shape, or form. We're all dealing with the same problem. Jesus promises the new heart. Why? Because he took our stain on himself. And by his blood, we are made clean. We'll celebrate that at the end of today's service. The second thing he promises is new identity. We hear a lot about identity in our world today. But what is identity? It's just how you come to think of yourself. It's what you think of yourself. 
And we are told, Jesus said, you must be born again. Paul said, uh, anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. In Romans, Paul teaches us that when we come to faith in Christ, we are adopted into a new family as the children of God. It means as followers of Jesus, we are no longer identified primarily by, for example, our culture, by our physical appearance, by our accomplishments, by our education, by our wealth, none of that. We're primarily identified by the transforming love of Christ. It's Jesus who tells us who we are because he's our shepherd and we belong to him. Thirdly, the gospel gives us new purpose. Now, what's our purpose? To make as much money as we can? No. To live as comfortable a life as we can? No. Our purpose is to live and serve in the eternal kingdom of God. Now, why are we as a church planning one whole day, August 24th, to serve all together? Why are we even doing that? What difference does it make in the world, really? We're doing it because that's what we were recreated in Christ to do. We live and serve in a community called the church, and whether that community is in Tanzania or Uganda or Turkey or here, it's all the same. We are to live in a community that by its very presence in the world announces that a new kingdom is here because there's a new king on the throne. That's our purpose. And finally, fourthly, the gospel gives us new destiny. A new destiny. One of the places I visited was the Cure, C-U-R-E, Hospital of Uganda. Pastor Jeff visited one of these in um, Zambia a couple of years ago. The one in Uganda focuses on neurological surgery, uh, particularly the issues of hydrocephalus and spina bifida because they're kind of connected. And I took pictures as Pastor Fred led me around. We prayed for these little, little, little children and their mothers. But I, I decided not to put them on the screen because I didn't want to create trauma. These are little babies, as old as that one right there, whose heads are two, three, four times normal size because of fluid on their brains. And they develop a procedure to help these children save their lives, prevent brain damage, and hopefully give them a, a, a hope and a future. It was hard to look at, just heartbreaking. And then this morning, wake up the stories of another mass shooting in Dayton to go along with the one in El Paso. And we're just overwhelmed. But when I say new destiny, it tells me that this life, the Bible says this life, this earthly life, with all its pains and all its struggle and all its brokenness is not all there is. Our eternal destiny is to live with and reign with Jesus in the new heaven and new earth forever. That is a place where there's no more sin, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more disease, and no more death. This is the new life. This is the fullness of life that Jesus promises. So, how do we listen to the shepherd? How do we learn to distinguish his voice? How do we hear? Does he still speak today? He does. Let me mention two ways. First, through his word. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to teach and to guide, and the Spirit does that primarily through God's word. We learn to hear the shepherd's voice by learning his word, just as my brother and I learned to listen to our father's whistle by hearing it every day of our lives. We could hear it, and I could still hear it today. So also, there's no substitute for time spent in God's word. Read, dwell on it, pour over it, stay with a single verse, stay with a single line, until he speaks to you, because he will, he promises. The second way is through prayer. And whenever I think of listening in prayer, I think of a, a time when I was young, maybe 12 years old, uh, my dad was a pastor, and I burst into his office one day, and he was on the phone with someone. So I, I realized I was interrupting, so I went to back out of the room, and he went like, no, come on in, it's okay. And as I sat down and waited for him to be done on the phone call, I could hear a voice, it was an old fashioned phone, you know, kind of shaped like that. And I could hear through the receiver this voice, da, 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 talking away. And my dad was just going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he went, he covered it, he went, watch this. And he pulled out a drawer on his desk and he put the phone in the drawer. <laughs> and he shut it. Not the most pastoral thing to do, but... <laughs> he left it in there for about a minute and we just chatted. And then he took it out and I could hear the voice keep going, da, 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 da. <laughs> Because he knew that person would never stop to listen. He knew. And sometimes I think we pray like that a little bit. Then we pray, we talk, 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 help me, help me, help me, give me, give me, give me, give me, help me, help me, help me, and we're done. And what kind of relationship is one-sided like that? What kind of relationship where you never listen to the other person, what they have to say? Now, we know that prayer is asking, and that's a good thing, but it's more than that. It's gratitude, it's worship, 
But it's also listening, listening for the voice of the good shepherd speaking quietly through the Holy Spirit. So how do you know if he's speaking to you? Well, check with his word first. He'll never tell you something in contradictory that's contradictory to what he's already given us in his word. So it's important to know his word. And also talk to people you trust. Talk to a fellow believer. Talk to a pastor who can help you discern. Let me tell you this. There's nothing as powerful and exciting as this deep inner sense that the shepherd is speaking to you. I think he speaks a lot. We have to learn how to listen. I want to finish with a story some of you have heard me tell before, but I tell it often because it was so formative in my, in my own life. I was 25 years old, not yet married. Believed I had a call from God to, to, to ministry, but I didn't know how to, how, to, how to follow that call. I didn't know what I should do. I, I, do, I, do. Do I go to seminary? Do I get a job? Where do I go? Um, and so one night I decided I was just going to pray until I had an answer. I needed to know. And so I started with praying, and I prayed and prayed and prayed all the words I knew how to pray. When I finally just was done with words, I had no more words to pray. I was just in my little apartment. And in that moment when I stopped talking, the most interesting thing happened. I, I heard a voice, not, out, not weirdly, not, not outside, but inside, like a little whisper. And it said, he said, Brian, I love you. And I immediately argued back, I know that. <laughs> I know that. I need to know what you want me to do. Where do I go? Where do I go? Where do I? And he said it again, Brian, I love you. I know that. I've known that since I was five years old. You know I know that. Why do you say that? And he said it the third time, this time more insistently, Brian, just stop. I love you. And that weird thing happened. At the third time, I began to weep. And I don't weep very easily, except in sports movies. But I don't, I don't weep very easily. <laughs> but I was just weeping, and I realized what had happened. Bef he, what, what Jesus wanted me to know is before I could do anything, before I could serve him in any way, I needed to know two things. First, I needed to know he loved me. And then I needed to know what his voice sounded like. I needed to recognize his voice. And you do too. We've been talking about adding a, a challenge to our, our, our spiritual disciplines all summer long. Here's what I want you to think about this week. It's very, very personal. I can't predict, I, I don't know how it works for you. But whatever you do spiritually, whatever, whether you take time in the morning, whether you take time at night, whether you walk, whether you do it on the commute to work, but add something, add a couple of minutes. At first, just a couple of minutes, because it'll feel like an eternity. Just add a couple of minutes to listen. Stop talking, stop asking, and just listen. Ask him to speak to you, and just wait. And by the end of the week, maybe Friday, Saturday, take an extended time, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and just listen the best you can. Maybe you hear the shepherd's quiet voice whispering your name. Maybe it'll be an encouragement. Maybe it'll be a challenge. Maybe it'll be a conviction. But he does speak if we listen. I want you to bow your heads now. As before Sterling comes and leads us through communion, I'm going to give you just a few moments to just quiet your heart, partly in preparation for communion, partly just to, to practice listening for just a few moments. Listen for the voice of the shepherd. Speak in your name. Listen to him calling you to follow.